good evening everybody a warm welcome to okay on mechanical ventilation tips and tricks this webinar has created a lot of excitement and lot of curiosity and interest in all our delegates guilty across the country who is going to tell us all about basics of mechanical ventilation all the tips and tricks that will help us improve our patient care uh, we have uh, basically two talks today which will be followed by a panel discussion this is an initiative of indian chess society and on behalf of indian chess society i would like to thank dr sandeep salvi our president and dr rajadhar and entire indian chess society governing council for making sure that we are percolating good level of education across our country and improving patient care so with this brief introduction i would like to invite our first speaker dr rakesh shavla who actually requires no introduction rajesh whatsoever shavla. he has been the sorry i'm so sorry dr rajesh shavla i'm i'm very sorry dr shavla sorry uh, so we have dr rajesh shavla uh, he needs no introduction at all he is the consultant uh, uh, chest physician director head of the department at indraprastha uh, hospital at delhi he has been the past president of critical care society of india he has also been the past president of nccp he is a fantastic researcher his interest is to teach a great teacher and he has been an intensivist one of the first primary critical care intensivists who i have known and um, also a very very dear friend of mine lots of papers lots of publications and lot of students who really idolize him with this brief introduction i would request dr rajesh shavla to please start with the first talk basics of mechanical ventilation over to you sir thank you dr amita and uh, dr khilani and other faculty members so we are going to talk on a extremely important topic which i think is relevant nowadays for everyone who is practicing chest as well as the critical care and i think if you understand the basic of mechanical ventilation well then it is it becomes much simpler to understand the various modes and advancement which occur in this science so what i am going to talk is about the very basic of mechanical ventilation so objectives of my talk are basically to understand the physiology of mechanical ventilation to understand the basic modes of mechanical ventilation when and how to initiate uh, mechanical ventilation to understand the monitoring and complication so common indications i think whenever a patient is unable to maintain uh, oxygenation or is unable to maintain the carbon dioxide we think of assisted ventilation and nowadays the first choice is a non invasive respiratory support either an hfnac in hypoxemic and the non invasive ventilation in hypercarbic if they are non effective or they are contraindicated then you think of the invasive ventilation and of course in apnea it is a first choice in operations i am not going to talk about that and many a times in the icu you do this to reduce the work of breathing so these are the four main indication where you do a invasive mechanical ventilation then the goals of ventilatory management are to maintain the adequate oxygenation to ventilate in such a manner that you have an acceptable pacio2 because i am saying acceptable many a times you tolerate the higher pacio2 to give a safe ventilation to reduce the work of breathing because that can also result in a bad outcome and you always ventilate in such a manner that you prevent the ventilator induced lung injury you know all ventilators do one thing they push in air that you know when you breathe normally you have a negative pressure ventilation you create a negative pressure in the pleura and you suck in air as there is a pressure gradient between your lung and the atmosphere the air is sucked in the ventilators like an ambush bag push air in the lung and you know and they give a breath what we call a mechanical breath 
So basically, all ventilators give you a breath, which is a mechanical breath. They push in air, and that's why it is called the positive pressure ventilation. So to give a breath, you require a machine, which is a compressor, which gives an air, and then you have a microprocessor-based or various other mechanism, which regulates this air, gives to the patient that it doesn't cause harm. So all ventilators to give the air to the patient, it has two walls, the inspiratory wall. When the inspiration occurs, the inspiratory valve opens, expiratory valve is closed, patients get the mechanical breath. And when both the valves are closed, there is an inspiratory pause. Sim and when now the expiratory valve opens, the inspiratory valve is closed, there is expiration. And when the, both the valves are closed, then there is an expiratory. Basically, all ventilators, you know, there are two basic ways that it gives a mechanical breath. Let me understand first the little physiology, if you want to understand this. Whenever you give a breath, there will be changes in three things. There will be change in pressure as the air is passing. There will be change in volume and there will be change in flow. Now, at one particular time, you can control one of these and the other two will vary depending on the airway resistance compliance of the lung and chest wall. Like if I fix up the pressure, the volume will vary depending on the resistance, airway resistance and the compliance of lung and chest wall. And if I give a fixed flow or volume, then the pressure will vary depending on the compliance of lung and chest wall. So this is the, and that's why based on this, we have a two kinds of breath. Volume limited breath and a pressure limited breath. The various nomenclature you will find, volume control breath, pressure control, or pressure preset or a volume preset. For discussion purposes today, I will call it a volume control and a pressure control. So volume control is where you fix up the flow and fix up the volume. And the pressure varies depending on the airway resistance and compliance in lung and chest wall. And a pressure control breath is where you fix up the inspiratory pressure. And the volume what patient will get will differ and based on the airway resistance and compliance of the lung and chest wall. So these are the two kind of breath. Now let me give you a little further and by a volume control breath. This is a pressure time graphics. We're showing a cartoon. If you see the above, the, as the inspiratory valve opens, the inspiratory flow starts and the pressure inside the lung rises. The maximum pressure you get during inspiration is called the peak inspiratory airway pressure. Which is, which is required to overcome the airway resistance and compliance of lung and chest wall. This is the maximum pressure, which is dependent not only on the airway resistance, but also the compliance. But what you are interested in, the what is the pressure the lung is getting, the lung tissue is getting. So you close both. As you can see in the second inspiratory and expiratory wall, both are closed. There is no flow and there is equalization of pressure in all the open unit. And the pressure you get is a plateau pressure, which is taken as surrogate that it should be less than 30. Normally, you don't keep it. Just to make you understand, I have done this. And then the expiratory valve opens and the expiration occurs. This is a, in a volume control breath, this is a pressure time graphics. Similarly, if you see the flow time graphics in a volume control breath, the inspiratory valve opens because the, we have fixed the flow, as I told you, the patient gets the same flow all through the inspiration, then there is a pause and then there is an expiration. The maximum pressure flow you get during this is called the peak inspiratory flow rate and the maximum expiratory flow you get is called the peak expiratory flow rate. The scalar, which is which will, where you see a negative deflection below the x-axis is a flow time graphics. Pressure time, volume time, they will always be above the x-axis. So a mechanical breath has four parts. See, whether it is a volume control or a pressure control breath, there are four parts. One is the trigger. The inspiratory valve has to open to deliver the breath. The factor which opens the inspiratory valve and starts the breath is called the trigger. It could be the machine 
or a time triggered if i fix up 12 breath per minute every 5 seconds inspiratory valve will open that's a time trigger or a patient creates makes an effort and based on the trigger sensitivity it opens that's a patient triggered patient triggered and which could be if i fix up a flow it is a flow trigger if i fix up pressure that if i fix up minus 1 to minus 3 and the moment it reaches the inspiratory valve so that's the first phase of a breath now the breath is delivered this is what you see is in a volume control breath patient is getting uh, the breath now the limit is the second phase of the breath that means this will not be exceeded all through the inspiration like i fix up 60 liters per minute the flow will not exceed the 60 liter it will reach there and remain all through this this is called flow limited in the pressure control breath patient gets a pressure and which remains all through that if i fix up 15 centimeter of water it will remain all through the inspiration and then th these cannot go the second phase cannot go it has to end the factor which will end this second phase whether it's a flow or pressure is called the cycling and then there is expiration so trigger limit cycle and expiration and this is just to show on the left side you have the volume control volume control breath where you see the flow is uniform all through and in the pressure limited as you can see the pressure is same but the flow is deaccelerating by nature in any pressure limited the flow will be deaccelerating because when the pressure starts in the beginning the lung pressure is a peep or maybe zero if your peep is zero so peep and the pressure outside is 16 as the pressure between the lung and the uh, the ventilator equalizes the flow will keep on falling like if there was 16 and 4 now 16 and 6 16 and 8 as it is equalizing the flow will keep on falling so always you will have a deaccelerating flow in the pressure limited breath in a volume mostly you should keep a uniform uh, flow but there are provision in the ventilator where you can make it deaccelerating so this is just to revise the trigger is a ventilator needs to know when to start a breath it may be triggered by patient or by the ventilator and it could be a time triggered when ventilator initiates a breath or patient triggered when you fix up a pressure as a trigger sensitivity of minus one to minus three it is a pressure trigger flow trigger you keep two to three liters per minute then it is a flow trigger whenever you see a pressure time graphic if you see a negative deflection that is a patient triggered if you see there is no negative reflection that is a machine trigger trigger sensitivity is the amount of pressure or flow you want to initiate a breath and the second phase is limit like in pressure control it is a pressure limited in a volume control it is a flow limited and it remains at that level till change over to expiration occur which is called the cycling change over from inspiration to expiration it is time in a pressure control breath and it is the uh, volume in a volume control breath actually it is time there also because nowadays you fix up a flow like i fix up 60 liter per minute and i fix up 500 ml so it will be delivered in 0.5 seconds so it is also time cycle for understanding purposes the volume in a volume control cycling and the time in a pressure control and then there is a flow cycle also like in a pressure support ventilation which i'll be talking about the cycling is neither time nor the volume but flow as i told you whenever you use a pressure whether it's a pressure support or a pressure control the flow will be deaccelerating now in a pressure control you time it's like one second or 1.5 second it will cycle to expiration but in a pressure support i fix up suppose the maximum flow is 100 and the minimum is zero i fix up when the flow reaches 25 percent of the maximum it will cycle that's called the flow cycling i can adjust this flow up and down based on the ventilator because this is called also called the e trigger in certain ventilators so if i compare the volume to versus pressure control 
the drawback of volume control is if your flow is not proper, patient will be gasping on a ventilator. Pat if patient can be flow deprived, no leak compensation. In a pressure control, when the compliance or airway resistance vary, the tidal volume may vary. Like patients, all right, now is developed ARDS, you fixed up 16 centimeter and tidal volume is getting low. So this is the, uh, but flow demands are met in pressure control. Patient is not flow deprived in pressure control. This is again in a volume control breath, you set up the tidal volume, in, you set up the uh, uh, tidal volume, you set up the rate, you set up the inspiratory flow, the inspiratory flow waveform. Usually, as I told you, I like constant. You can keep deaccelerating also. In pressure control, the flow is always deaccelerating. But as you can see on the lower pressure, the pressure is same all through the inspiration. The type of breath sometimes we use mandatory means. The ventilator determines either the start of inspiration or the end of inspiration or both. And assisted breath, if it is patient triggered, if is everything is being done by the ventilator, you sometimes call the control breath. Spontaneous means start and end, both are determined by the patient. You know, there are various modes. Everybody, sir, put on this mode and put on this modes. Mode means specifies the manner in which the pressure control or a volume control breath is delivered. That is called the modes. So what are the modes? CMV, CMV could be volume control if you give a volume control breath. CMV could be pressure control if you give a pressure control breath. Similarly, ACMV can be volume control and a pressure control. SAMV can be volume control and a pressure control based on which breath you are delivering. And pressure support, I have already talked, it is totally spontaneous breath. So let's talk about now control mechanical ventilation. All breaths are detected mandatory. This occurs when patient is paralyzed or patient is having no effort. All breaths are mandatory. You fix up the frequency, fix up the, depending on the mode, the tidal volume, the P, patient will get minute ventilation based on your respiratory rate and the tidal volume you fixed up. There is no extra. If I fix up 500 ml, 12 breaths, patient is getting 6 liter. This is a control Nothing extra patient. CMV could be volume control. Similarly, pressure control, if I fix up, patient will get inspiratory pressure and the tidal volume depending on the airway resistance and compliance and patient will get that much of the, in every breath that you have fixed up, like 12 breaths, inspiratory pressure of 12, the tidal volume will, minute ventilation will depend on the compliance of lung and chest wall and airway resistance. And it is time trigger. If it is a volume control breath you are giving, it will be flow limited. But if you are giving a pressure control breath, it will be pressure limited. Cycling is time in a pressure limited and volume in cases of volume control. CMV volume control, CMV pressure control. So this is what you see on this. So on the left side is a pressure triggered and right side is a volume. So it is time triggered flow limited and volume cycled. Flow is uniform, pressure varies, volume will be same in all the breath. There is nothing extra. On the left side, patient is getting the same pressure in every breath and the flow is deaccelerating and volume will depend. So this is CMV. Then there is ACMV. And actually, in fact, none of the ventilators have two knobs, ACMV or CMV. They call it CMV, IPP, whatever. When patient is paralyzed, it becomes the CMV. When patient is not paralyzed, it becomes the ACMV. The difference between ACMV volume control, ACMV pressure control, and the CMV is the patient can trigger the ventilator. Patient can open the inspiratory wall and access the extra breath. What you fix up, if I patient is breathing, and if I fix up ACMV mode or a CMV mode, I fix up 12 breaths per minute, 500 ml, now, this is the minimum patient will get. This is the backup rate. If this patient doesn't trigger the ventilator, he'll get that. But he can access as many times he triggers the ventilator, but he will get 500 ml, whatever you fixed up in a volume control, and he will get the pressure for that much time in a pressure control. So this is the 
ACMV and CMV. Suppose this patient gets tired, it will become CMV. The minimum rate, he will get what you have fixed on the ventilator. Then there is SIMV. SIMV is like same. You can have SIMV volume control and SIMV pressure control. Now, if it is SIMV volume control, uh, volume control, I fix up that SIMV rate of 6. That means whenever patient is assured only 6 breath from the ventilator, he can either open himself the inspiratory wall and get 6 births synchronized or machine will give every, let's say, 10 seconds, if I fix up 6 breaths per minute, every 10 seconds, the either the patient will trigger or the machine will give. In between, patient can spontaneously breathe like a negative pressure. As you can see here, this is a SMV pressure control. Flow is deaccelerating, pressure is uniform, the volume will vary depending on the airway resistance and the compliance of lung and chest wall. In between, you see a negative pressure breath. That is a spontaneous breath. And most of the time, this is not given alone. This is given along with pressure support to the spontaneous breath. That's why those are called SIMV pressure support. I'll talk about. Now, what is pressure support? Pressure support breaths are always initiated by the patient. Inspiratory valve is always opened by the patient. Trigger is a patient. Okay. Now, patient will get a pressure. Patient will get a pressure. And as the patient is getting that pressure, the flow is deaccelerating. It will keep on getting that pressure till the flow reaches the predetermined value which you have fixed on a ventilator like 25%. Or in a COPD patient, I want the inspiratory time, inspiration to be shorter. So I fix up 35%. I want more time for expiration. So at 35% of the peak flow, it will cycle to expiration. So patient is triggered, limit is pressure, and cycling is flow. And that you see here. As you were seeing, in a pressure control, this flow was leaching to the baseline. Here, the flow is ending here, where which based on the, this is the peak. This is, let's say, 25%. It cycles to expiration. Pressure is uniform. All breaths are initiated. As you see a negative reflection, that means all breaths are initiated by the patient. And volume will depend on your inspiratory pressure, patient effort, airway resistance, compliance of lung and chest wall, everything will determine how much the tidal volume patient is getting. As far as the work of breathing is concerned, minimum work of breathing by patient is done in CMV, followed by ACMV, and then by the maximum work of breathing is done by the pressure support ventilation. SIMV mode, usually we nowadays do not use, but it is it, in a patient hemodynamically unstable. A lot of people in the West and otherwise also use it. But I find ACMV and pressure support are good enough for most of the. So this is to increase the inspiratory time. You can decrease the percentage of peak flow. And to decrease the inspiratory time, you can increase the percentage of peak flow. Now, this is what I was talking. This is SIMV pressure control. As you see, flow is deaccelerating. Pressure control is, pressure is same. And to the spontaneous breath, we have given the pressure support. So what it is, SMV pressure control along with pressure support. So this is the, normally SMV is never given alone. So the cycling in this is flow, cycling in this is based on the time which you have fixed on a ventilator. And CPAP is nothing like a giving a peep and this is you give a uniform pressure all through the inspiration and expiration and patient takes a spontaneous breathing on this high FRC level and this keeps the airway open and it helps in patient the triggering the ventilator decreases the work of breathing keeps the uh, th th these are the mainly uses and most of the time you use it along with pressure support during weaning. Now, initiating a ventilation, just 5-10 minutes more. So, when you want to give, first you should be very clear what you're giving. You should make sure the whole your staff knows that mode. You should not keep on getting the fancy mode where only one or two sisters know. And then most of the time at night, you will have to change to this. So, AC, MV, 
वॉल्यूम कंट्रोल और सिस्ट कंट्रोल प्रेशर कंट्रोल दिस दीज आर दी ए सी एम वी वॉल्यूम कंट्रोल और ए सी एम वी प्रेशर कंट्रोल दीज आर द कॉमनेस्ट यूज मोड सो यू प्रिपेयर योर सडेशन एन एल जी जिया यू वॉन्ट गिव फेंटनिल यू वॉन्ट गिव मिडाज यू वॉन्ट गिव एट्राक्यूरियम मॉनिटरिंग इक्विपमेंट पेशेंट इज प्रॉपरली the venous excess is there baseline investigation abg is there check your intubation if it's a elective intubation inform the family what you are going to do manual ventilation with bag and check your electrical oxygen compressor and attach the bag which is available with a ventilator so that your ventilator settings are okay choose the mode i told you then volume control acmv tidal volume 6 ml now it is we in a normal patient also 6 to 8 ml or 6 ml respiratory rate 12 to 14 fio2 to, to begin with you can start with 1 or 100% oxygen and then based on the requirement secondary setting peep begin with 4 trigger sensitivity if it is flow 2 if it is uh, pressure trigger sensitivity minus 1 to minus 3 do not keep below this otherwise auto triggering will occur i ratio at least 1 is to 2 or 1 is to 3 and set alarms 10 to 20% above the settings which you have set on a ventilator and peak airway pressure alarm based on the pathophysiology because if it is a you are ventilating asthma on copd peak pressure alarm you have to keep clearly little high because uh, otherwise it will keep keep on getting cut off and patient will not get the uh, the volume so begin always with a ambus bag or a manual ventilation and do not do not do too much of ambus bag and watch for hypotension because you given sedation you are giving a positive pressure patient may be relatively dehydrated there is a decrease in venous return and patient can get a hypotension then the tidal all these settings i have already talked about and these are the settings of alarm 10 to 20% above and below the inspired mechanical ventilation low pressure alarm 5 to 15 high peak pressure at least 40 to 45 apnea time and all these if patient has normal lung these are the if patient has high airway resistance you always give a low tidal volume and low respiratory rate like in copd and asthma and a high peak flow you will have to tolerate if the patient has low compliance then you give a low tidal volume moderate to high respiratory rate high fio2 and peep peep high depending on your fio ratio confirm the chest expansion start sedation relaxant nowadays we don't use sedation and analgesia is the only thing put a foley's catheter because i always uh, remember one patient about 20 years ago patient was ventilated very distressed and he was not put on a foley's catheter so foley's catheter ng tube check x ray and abg in 20 minutes start anti gastritis because the chances of stress ulcers are very high in a ventilated patient so you start anti gastritis dvt prophylaxis and eye care you must inform the sister what to observe in a volume control plateau pressure and peak pressure and low pressure alarms during pressure control you look at the expired tidal volume and expired minute ventilation if you are getting a high pip that means either you put on a very thin tube airway narrowing decrease lung compliance increase tidal volume all these is usually dependent on the resistance and sensitive to changes in the flow rate if you increase the flow rate the peak pressure will also rise so but this is the uh, you should observe and look for what is the, if it is a kinking of the tube you can correct if there are correctable causes you must correct then complication of mechanical ventilation may be related to intubation you may injure then the it could be related to ventilator like hypotension raised intracranial pressure pneumothorax can also occur also one of the causes of uh, hypotension particularly in copd if the person was doing too much ambus after intubating causing the dynamic hyperinflation in the and the pneumothorax so that's why when you intubate copd or asthma do not give more than 10 breaths and i ask the resident to count 10 before giving a breath do not bother about pco2 or po2 once your tube is in and then of course the and the all these uh, side effects are easily manageable by the patient so just to end here because the time is up 
So key points, all ventilators do only one thing, push in air, give a mechanical breath. Use the mode of ventilation which is familiar to the whole staff. Before initiating mechanical ventilation, you must check the equipment circuit connections. Otherwise, every other person is running for something. During volume preset ventilation, monitor peak and plateau. Pressure preset ventilation, monitor expired tidal volume and expired minute volume. Ventilatory strategy is more important than the mode. Prevent villi and prevent dynamic hyperinflation in COPD and ventilator-associated lung injury in ARDS. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajesh Shavla. This was honestly one of the best talks on basics of ventilation that I have ever heard. And I honestly picked up some very, very subtle points which I'm going to definitely put into my practice. And uh, my residents and so many people are messaging that this is the best talk they've ever heard. And first time they've understood mechanical ventilation in detail correctly. Thank you so much. I mean, bravo. That was brilliant. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Yes. With this fabulous first talk, which has made our basics so very clear. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Vishweswaran, my very, very dear friend. A young consultant from Yashoda Hospital. He is brilliant whether we talk about interventional pulmonology or critical care or normal chest, whatever we talk about. When you look at him, you just wonder, wow, at a young age, he's achieved just so much. His talks are fabulous, just so informative. And he's going to give us information about things which are so very important for our day-to-day -day practice. So Dr. Vishweswaran is going to be talking about disease-specific ventilatory settings what disease you are suffering from and what ideal setting should you be giving. So I'm sure we're going to learn so much from Dr. Vishweswaran's talk. So over to you, Dr. Vishweswaran. Thank you. Good evening, uh, everyone. And first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Amit Anane for giving me this opportunity to uh, present this uh, lecture on mechanical ventilation in specific lung condition. So uh, before I move into the specific lung condition, there are a few basic things which we have to understand when it comes to mechanical ventilation. So if you see the image here, you can see that we generally do have some sort of a normal shunt in the body. But however, in certain cases, you can have an anatomical shunt, which is like when you have got a congenital heart disease or other things. Similarly, in a condition like ARDS, you can have shunt lesions which can result in significant uh, deoxygenation and can cause fall in the saturation levels. Another important concept when it comes to the uh, using the mechanical ventilator is mecha physiologically we have we generate a negative intrathoracic pressure to cause the alveoli to expand but however when we move to the invasive positive pressure ventilation we give a positive pressure which can sometimes cause in distension of the alveoli, which is an excessive distension of the alveoli in comparison to the normal alveoli. So when there is an alveoli which is extensively distended, it can cause an increased shunt and it can cause an increase in the dead space ventilation. So either an increase in the shunt or an increase in the dead space ventilation can result in worsening of your oxygenation level. Why we really have to understand the mechanical ventilation is Though mechanical ventilation can be really life supportive device, it can also result in lot of injury to the lung, which extends sometimes even beyond the lung in the form of a biotrauma. So you can have a bio barotrauma, which is because of the pressure. You can have adverse effects related to mechanical ventilation because of oxygen toxicity. You can have volumotrauma, atelectotrauma, and biotrauma. So what essentially happens is whenever you give a patient is put on mechanical ventilation, the alveoli are stretched, which causes shearing stretch, over distension, and even the cyclical stretch, all these things lead to increase in the alveolar capillary impermeability, and it brings about a decrease in the cardiac output because of positive pressure and decreased organ perfusion. And these things can all affect the distal organs. In addition to this, this biotrauma, that is because of the stretch of the alveoli, which releases the cytokines, that can also bring about a lot of uh, dysregulation in the other organs. Finally, all these things leads to multi-organ dysfunction, which means if you don't give proper pressure through the mechanical ventilation, what is considered to be beneficial can also become harmful because of the hazards associated with mechanical ventilation. 
In addition to this, this is something which we all know that whenever an alveoli is stretched, sometimes it can rupture, it can cause pneumomediastinum, pneumothorax, pneumopericardium, and sometimes it can also cause the pulmonary interstitial emphysema. So now moving on to the specific uh, lung conditions and how do we really have to optimize the mechanical ventilator setting for these conditions. The first and the foremost and the prototype for any respiratory disorder is the ARDS. So whenever you have a patient with an ARDS, it can be because of pulmonary ARDS, which means that the lungs are primarily affected, like in the case of a viral pneumonia, or it can be an extra pulmonary ARDS, like it can be uh, where the air, lung is a bystander, like what occurs in case of a um, pancreatitis or in, in case of sepsis or even in case of uh, sometimes uh, other extra pulmonary causes like uh, uh, during the times of trauma. So all these things can also cause ARDS or the acute respiratory distress syndrome. So whenever we deal with an acute respiratory syndrome, the cause of the hypoxic failure can be because of a ventilator perfusion mismatch or it can be because of right to left shunt and sometimes very rarely in a it can be because of alveolar hyperventilation or diffusion abnormalities and sometimes it can be even because of inadequate FIO2. So sometimes there can be a problem with your ventilators. So whenever a patient comes to us with an ARDS, we generally advise mechanical ventilation to decrease the whenever a patient is having an increased work of breathing or there is an oxygen impairment or an impending respiratory failure or in an acute ventilator failure. So how are we going to set the ventilator for a patient with an ARDS? So you, from the previous lecture, you would have understood the basic modes of mechanical ventilation. So when it comes to the ARDS, generally, when you immediately sedate and paralyze the patient, you put these patients on a controlled or an assist controlled modes of mechanical ventilation. And generally, the pressure control is preferred in certain cases, but with with current uh, alarms and monitors that are available, you can put either modes of ventilation and it should be a controlled or an assist control mode of ventilation. And you set a respiratory rate of 20 to 40 per minute and you choose either a pressure or a volume control mode. And the most important concept when it comes to managing a patient with an ARDS is the tidal volume, which means the lung protective ventilation forms the cornerstone for management of an ARDS. So you need to choose 4 to 8 ml per kilogram of an ideal body weight. Unlike your true body weight, there is a formula for calculating your ideal body weight. You need to choose 4 to 8 ml for, per kilogram of an ideal body weight as the tidal volume for your patient. And when you give this 4 to 8 ml per kilogram of tidal uh, ideal body weight as tidal volume, you need to make sure your plateau pressure does not go more than 30 centimeters of water. Then you set the inspiratory time. The inspiratory time is generally set at 0.5 to 0.8 seconds. And so, however, in certain cases, you can have a short end inspiratory pause and passive ventilation also. And when it comes to the PEEP, there are multiple ways of setting up the PEEP for a patient with an ARDS. But however, the most commonly followed method of setting the PEEP for a patient with an ARDS is the FIO2 PEEP table, which is available in all the literature. In addition to this, there are certain other uh, modalities like you can use something called as a direct uh, recruitment maneuvers and then titrate the PEEP and even you can use an esophageal manometer to titrate the PEEP and the emerging concept with respect to the management of the PEEP is what we refer to as a driving pressure. That means when you give this much amount of tidal volume, you calculate the difference between the plateau pressure and the PEEP. If the difference between the plateau pressure and the PEEP is less than 14, that means that the patient is having poor compliance of the lung, then, then the patient is known to have a poor prognosis. But let's say that I give 4 to 8 ml per kilogram of body weight and I calculate the driving pressure, that is the PEEP plat minus PEEP, and if it is more than 14 centimeters of water, that means the difference is more still I am able to achieve the adequate tidal volume and oxygenation, that means the patient is having a better lung compliance and they can have a better prognosis. So of late, the management of the uh, ARDS is moving to the concept of a driving pressure and you have to remember there is something called as a driving pressure, which is nothing but the PEEP lat minus PEEP. So you choose the PEEP somewhere between around 10 to 20 initially and the lowest level is taken to achieve the target SpO2 or PaO2 range. 
and the FIO2 should be initially started at 100%, but gradually you need to bring down the FIO2 as early as possible because we have seen that excessive oxygenation can itself cause worsening of your ARDS because of free radical mechanism and oxygen toxicity. So once you start this patient on these settings, what are we going to monitor? The most important aspect when it comes to the ARDS is the management of the PF ratio and you need to keep monitoring your PaO2 in the ABG and you want it somewhere between 55 to 80 millimeters of mercury and even excessive maintenance, excessive oxygenation that is PaO2 more than 80 millimeter is also detrimental for your patient. And you need to monitor the PaCO2. You, it is better to attain a normal value but in ARDS, permissive hypercapnia is allowed. So that means that means you need not achieve a normal pH. Sometimes you can have a pH even as low as 7.20, accepting higher levels of PaCO2. And this, and if you can maintain a lung protective strategy with this permissive hypercapnia, even then it is advisable. So can accept the rise in CO2 even though the pH drops to 7 point, till 7.20. So this concept of permissive hypercapnia is found to be beneficial to protect the patient lung against the barotrauma and the biotrauma which are caused by your mechanical ventilation. And the PEEP, once you set a PEEP, then you try to gradually decrease the PEEP to maintain an adequate PEEP uh, which is necessary for maintaining the saturation level. And the P-plat is the most important thing. We want the P-plat to be less than or equal to 30 centimeters of water. But this 30 centimeters of water can be even can go to a higher level if you are dealing with a patient where the compliance of the uh, chest is decreased by the chest wall. Let's say that you have a patient with an excessive, excessively obese patient or a patient who has got a um, uh, chest wall abnormality. And sometimes you can even cross this P plat pressure more than 30 centimeters of water to attain the adequate ventilation for your patient. And make sure that your tidal volume ranges between 4 to 8 ml per kilogram of an ideal body weight. And if you can maintain this, then probably you are protecting your patient lung from mechanical injury and other injuries caused by your mechanical ventilation. So again, to recapitulate, so first you calculate the ideal body weight. And once you calculate the ideal body weight, you set your tidal volume at 4 to 8 ml per kilogram of ideal body weight. And you set the respiratory rate as 20 to 30 per minute. Initial FAO2 should be 1 and PEEP you take somewhere between 10 to 20 depending upon your PEEP and FAO2 table. Once it is done, then right now what we follow is the ARDS net approach or the lung protective ventilation. So you want to make your P plat less than 30 centimeters of water. And recently, as I said to you before, we have this concept of the driving pressure where the P plat minus P should be less than 14, uh, should be more than uh, 14 centimeters of water. So in certain cases, if you have a stiff chest wall, then you can increase. Sometimes your P plat can go a little higher than your 30 centimeters of water and titrate your PEEP to the highest chest compliance and try to maintain the PEEP at less than 30 if there are no stiff chest wall. And once it is done, once you have attained the PEEP at uh, more than 30 centimeters of water, then let's say that you have started with 6, but right now if your PEEP at is going more than 30, then you decrease your tidal volume and you can go as low as 4 ml per kilogram. But if your P plat is less than 30 and still you are able to achieve oxygenation, then you look for asynchrony. If there is any asynchrony, then you can increase your tidal volume to as high as 8 ml per kilogram. But if asynchrony is not there, then you target your saturation levels by titrating your FiO2 between 88 to um, 95 percentage. But here is the most important thing, unlike in other lung conditions, in ARDS, you have rescue modes of ventilation. That means if you are not able to attain a lung protective ventilation, that means your PF ratio is less than 150, that despite and you are not able to attain a lung protective ventilation, then you can consider prone ventilation. And sometimes if the PF ratio is further less 
and there is no significant contraindications for ECMO. You can even put these patients on ECMO. And as I said to you before, in a pure ARDS, you need you need not target a normal pH. You can even go as low as one point seven point two to allow for permissive hypercapnia, provided you are able to maintain this patient on lung protective ventilation. But let's say that the pH goes very low, then probably you may have to consider a prone ventilation or even an ECMO in such cases. So as I said to you before, one of the important concepts in ARDS is the prone ventilation. Why do we really do the prone ventilation? Because it improves the DQ mismatch. It increases the ventilation in the dependent areas of the lung. It decreases the physiological shunt, and it improves the ventilation in areas where perfusion remains the same. It decreases the compression and increases the FRC because, the, because of the gravity dependent effect of the cardiac uh, by the heart. And it also protects against the ventilator associated lung injury. And sometimes it also enhances the mobilization of secretion. So right now, if your patient, if you put a patient on lung protective ventilation with a P-plat less than 30 centimeters of water and a driving pressure um, more than 14 centimeters of water and you and you are not able to maintain an adequate pf ratio then you have to go for pruning and sometimes you may even have to go for ECMO. so to put it in a nutshell when it comes to the ards lung protective strategy with a low tidal volume and inspiratory pressures the recommendation is strong and even early pruning is advisable and even daily pruning of greater than 12 hours is advocated and in, previously we used to have a lot of discussion about the high frequency oscillatory ventilation right now there is no recommendation for a high frequency oscillatory ventilation and mechanical ventilation with the higher levels of PEEP for moderate to severe ARDS is conditional which means in selected cases you can try especially when you have got a poor chest wall compliance and recruitment maneuvers should be used it's a conditional recommendation these days very rarely we use the recruitment maneuvers but previously you used to use the recruitment maneuvers for titrating the peep and additional research needed to recommend use of ECMO in patients with ARDS, but this is changing. So many patients we see who are not able to be maintained on a lung protective ventilation. Off late, we are putting these patients on early ECMOs and the outcomes are very good. In addition to this, the other guidelines also favor the same. And one important thing which everybody favors is the low tidal volume. That is 4 to 8 ml per kilogram of ideal body weight and plateau pressure should be less than 30 centimeters of water and early pruning should be right in patients who are candidates for pruning. Another most important thing which is always neglected in an ICO is the conservative fluid management. So whenever you have a patient with an ARDS, they have a leaky capillaries. Therefore, you need to make sure that the fluid is not overloaded in these patients, which can bring down the lung compliance. And neuromuscular agents uh, should be given early in the course of ARDS to prevent the asynchrony and lung damage. So in the interest of the time, I will go a little faster with the other disorders. The next important disorder that we come is the COPD. So we all know that uh, most of our patients with COPD get improved with only NIV. But if your patient is not a candidate for NIV, like they cannot protect their airway, mentally, airway protection, or they are unable to fit a mask, or they are uncooperative or anxious, then in those or patients who are having a uh, hemodynamic instability, or sometimes even when your pH goes very low, that is less than 7.25, then they become the candidates for invasive mechanical ventilation. So one important concept that we have to understand in while ventilating a patient with a COPD is the pulmonary time constant, which is nothing but the compliance into resistance. So what it essentially means is, let's say that I am going to give an air here. Not all alveoli are going to get uniformly distended. And once the air goes in, it requires certain amount of time for it to come out. If we don't provide this time constant and we give another inflation during the same time, then it results in excessive distension of the alveoli. And as we saw earlier, this can cause dead space ventilation. And sometimes this causes an auto peep and this results in problem with the triggering of the patient asynchrony. And sometimes it can produce cardiovascular abnormalities in your patients. So whenever you use a pressure ventilation and you see for the same pressure in a patient with a COPD on ventilator, the tidal volume is falling, then you need to consider there could be an element of an autopeep. 
and sometimes when you are using a volume control ventilation you see that the peak pressure peak alveolar pressure and the peak airway pressure both are rising for the same tidal volume then probably with every breath there is more stacking of the air inside the alveoli leading to dynamic hyperinflation and generation of auto peak so how do we go how are we going to correct the auto peak you can give an external peak to counteract the auto peak and sometimes even a mild disconnection from the ventilator to deflate the lung and connecting back to the ventilator are tried in certain cases but the most time tested technique is you give adequate bronchodilation to open up the airways so that the the time so that the, you provide enough time, space for the air for exhalation thereby decreasing the alveolar hyperdistension so when a patient of a copd comes to you the mode can be an assist or a control mode the the difference main difference when it comes to ventilating copd from ards is the rate in ards you go as high as 20 to 30 per minute whereas here the rate is around 8 to 15 per minute you choose a pressure or a volume control mode of ventilation and the tidal volume even for copd lung protective ventilation with 8 to m 6 to 8 ml per kilogram of ideal body weight with the plateau pressure less than 30 cm is advocated and here the most important thing is your inspiratory time and the respiratory rate and the inspiratory time was some kept somewhere between 0.6 to 1 another important variation from your ards in your ards you can go as high as 10 12 sometimes we have gone to 15 and 16 peep also but in your copd patients generally you set a 5 cm water of peep or sometimes you titrate the peep to counteract the auto peep by looking into the synchrony of the patient also another important variation is in copd we don't want higher oxygenation levels to prevent the haldane effect so you try to keep the fio2 as minimal as possible so i'm not going into this um, in the interest of time but what we really have to see when we ventilate a patient with copd is the patient ventilator synchrony so whenever there is a patient ventilator asynchrony these patients are prone to develop auto peep that means the they take more amount of air and causes alveolar distension so that should be avoided again as we have spoken earlier auto peep should be monitored and the peep plat pressures should be seen and always look into the hemodynamics if you over ventilate a patient of copd they can have an increase in the intrathoracic pressure which decreases the venous return and can cause a hemodynamic instability in addition to this you need to keep looking into the pulse oximetry levels and abg to look into the co2 and always look for clinical signs of cardiopulmonary distress and with respect to asthma again as with respect to copd here also we can use an assist or control mode of ventilation but the rate can be slightly higher it can be 8 to 20 per minute and the another important thing is when you are ventilating a patient of a status asthmaticus you should not try to wash out the co2 sometimes you because the lung pressures may go very high so in such cases you can allow for permissive hypercapnia as you saw in ards and um, tidal volume should be very less it should be 4 to 8 ml per kilogram of an ideal body weight and p plat should be less than or equal to 30 cm of water and here you need to give an inspiratory time of around 1 to 1.5 seconds and like the copd when we give 0.6 to 1 second and you need to make sure you adequately bronchodilate these patients sometimes you need to give steroids sometimes you need to give magnesium to bring about bronchodilation to avoid the auto peep and sometimes um, you may have to slightly increase the peep to counteract the auto peep but this should be done carefully because if you give an external peep which is more than that of the auto peep it can further worsen your auto peep and here you can target an fio2 uh, of around uh, fio2 to maintain a pao2 of around 55 to 80 mm of mercury or a saturation 88 to 95 percentage but however one of the most important things that should be remembered when you are ventilating a patient of a severe asthma is that these airway pressures can go very high and they are at a higher risk of developing barotrauma in the form of a pneumomediastinum or a pneumothorax and they always monitor and one another area where pulmonologists are routinely called is in the neuro issues in patients with head injury and these patients generally get intubated when they have a depression due to a primary neurological insult or they can have associated injuries to the spine chest and abdomen or sometimes they can have a neurogenic edema or sometimes because of the medicines and the paralytics which they give in the icu so in such cases put these patients on control mode of ventilation and the rate should be 15 to 25 per minute and it should be a volume or pressure controlled mode of ventilation again the concept remains the same you target a tidal volume of 6 to 8 ml per kilogram of ideal body weight with a plateau pressure less than or equal to 30 cm of water 
and the insulated time should be one second and beep should be five centimeters provided that the beep does not increase the icp this is very very important if you give too much of beep then it prevents the venous return to the heart and it can increase your icp and you need to be very cautious of this and the fio2 should be one so whenever you put these patients on mechanical ventilator always look for peak alveolar pressures mean airway pressures and auto peak PaCO2 and end tidal CO2 is must because any rise in the CO2 can cause cerebral vasodilation and can increase your intracranial pressure. So always we try to attain either a normocapnia and sometimes we even go for a hypocapnia. But the studies clearly says that normocapnia is sufficient, but you should never have an hypercapnia in a patient with head injury because it causes cerebral vasodilation and increases your ICP. And uh, intracranial pressure and jugular venous oxygen saturation should be monitored and hemodynamic stability should be assessed. And the last part of the topic is the mechanical ventilation in a post-operative patient. In post-operative, it can be because of the drugs or it can be because of cardiorespiratory distress or pre-existing lung conditions, which has put this patient on um, ventilator post-surgery. So in a patient who does not have a prior disease, you give the routine setting that is a control mode of ventilation with the respiratory rate of 12 to 18 per minute. And the tidal volume is 6 to 8 ml per kilogram of ideal body weight. And the peep should be less than or equal to 5 centimeter. And you target a saturation uh, of more than around 95 or a PAO to more than 8. But if a patient is having an obstructive airway disease, we follow the protocol just like in COPD, where you control the rate between 12 to 8 stimulators of mercury. So one last part of the topic is the ventilator settings in a patient with a BPM. This is a very, very controversial area because sometimes any positive pressure in a patient with a BPF can worsen the BPF. So what we do is we try to give the same amount of minute ventilation by decreasing the tidal volume and by increasing the respiratory rate. So you can go for a higher respiratory rate like 10 to 30 per minute or even greater. And you target a very low tidal volume of 4 to 8 ml per kilogram of ideal body weight. And inspiratory time should be 0.3 to 0.8 depending on air leak. And you can give a high FIO2 more desirable than the higher pressure and sometimes um, in certain cases what we have done is we have done a master and a slave ventilator that means you put a double lumen tube in this patient isolate the lung which has got the pneumothorax and connect it to a low ventilator settings and ventilate the other lung normally and in nowadays off late whenever a patient is having a bpf and they are not improving on positive pressure ventilation you can even take these patients on ecmo allow the lung to heal and then put them back on mechanical ventilator if you are not able to surgically correct it or you can correct it by bronchoscopic methods of BPF closure. So to put it in a nutshell, to summarize, our target range of PAO2 for patients with ARDS is 55 to 80 millimeters of mercury. But when it comes to CO, COPD or um, any type of respiratory failure, we try to target between 50 to 65 millimeters of mercury. And the PA CO2 in a normal lung is 35 to 45 and in lung injury you can even allow permissive hypercapnia and even in asthmatic patients if you are not able to ventilate with a lung protective you can allow permissive hypercapnia to go as high as um, 80 millimeters of mercury with a pH of around 7.2 but you cannot allow permissive hypercapnia in a patient with a head injury. And the pH, the desirable pH is 7.35 to 7.45. But when you are dealing with a case of a ARDS, as I said to you before, if you allow permissive hypercapnia, then a pH even greater than 7.2 is, um, is acceptable. And uh, for a normal lung patient, so the normal lung mechanics, we ventilate with 6 to 8 ml per kilogram of ideal body weight of tidal volume with a respiratory rate of 15 to 20 per minute. For ARDS, you give lower the tidal volume to attain a lung protective ventilation. And you can compensate for the minute ventilation by increasing the respiratory rate to 20 to even 30 per minute. And in extreme cases, you can even go up to 35 per minute. And for obstructive lung disease, the one important change is that uh, we need to allow more time for exhalation. So we keep the respiratory rate low and we keep the inspiratory time to 0.5 to 0.6 to uh, 1 second. And we keep the respiratory rate between 8 to 12 breaths per minute. So I'd like to end the presentation here. And if there are any questions, we can take it in the question and answer section. Thank you.
thank you very much dr vishwas this was really an enlightening talk it was very very practical because we all know that there are different kinds of ventilation we know about different kinds of settings but it's very very important for us to know as pulmonologist mm. in which pulmonary disease what would be the best kind of ventilation so thank you so much for such an informative talk and everybody has been enjoying the talk we've been getting wonderful feedbacks already from people and we already have about 42 questions that have been asked to us so we're going to quickly going to start our panel discussion and uh, before starting the panel discussion i'd like to uh, i'd like to introduce our esteemed panel to everybody we have a star panel with us and uh, i mean you know all of them are absolute achievers in the field of pulmonary critical medicine and it's so ha i'm so happy that they will be enlightening us today first and foremost we have the Dr. G.C. Khirnani, sir, requires no introduction whatsoever. He is a North Zone chairperson of our Indian Chair Society. Sir is one of the biggest academicians I have known. He is so interested in disseminating knowledge. Anything that is new, that is coming up in respiratory medicine, sir's video is there where he's done all the R&D and he gives us all the up-to-date uh, information on it. So, sir is the chairman of PSRI Institute of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. And everybody knows, sir, has been the past head of the Department uh, of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine in Ames. And uh, a warm welcome to you, sir. We are so happy Thank to you. have you with Thank us. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. After this, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Manoj Singh, a pulmonary critical care expert from my own Ahmedabad. Everybody knows I'm a Gujarati. He belongs to Ahmedabad, though he's not a Gujarati, but he makes us very, very proud. He is an amazing achiever. As I said, his area of interest mainly is pulmonary, uh, image, uh, pulmonary critical care, but over and above, he really specializes in mm. critical care, which I think is amazing. I know very few people who do this. And of course, he does IP, lung rebound, and so many things. What is really remarkable about him is that two times, Two times he's got the Presidential Citation Critical Care Award. It was in 2016 and 2022. And he received the TOI Health Icon Critical Care Award in chess in 2020 and 2021. And Young Academician Award by, was given by Apollo Group in 2022. Uh, he has so many affiliations, so much more to talk about him. But I think this should be enough to begin with. So warm welcome to you, Dr. Manoj. Thank you for being a part of us. Thank you, ma'am. After this, I'd like to introduce a lovely, a bright, and a wonderful pulmonologist, Dr. Anshum Aneja Arora. She is so she is extremely enthusiastic, and she loves to really educate people. She also makes her self-teaching videos on so many interesting topics, and she circulates them everywhere, and they get the highest number of thumbs ups that I know about. So she, of course, has so many affiliations. She is in Gurugram. She is connected with the Arrow Health Gurugram, Birla Hospital, and also Verizon Hospital Gurugram. And in addition to special interest in pulmonary critical care, what I what I'm really impressed about is that she is interested in, you know, in pediatric sleep medicine, which I think is something so difficult and so rare. So a girl with many many publications, keen interest in academics, and a great teacher. So warm welcome to you, Anshu. Thank yes. you so much for being on board. Thank you so much. Ma yes. And with this, I'd like to invite Dr. Nilanjan Umesh. Again, a person with special interest and expertise in pulmonary critical care. He is from Rajgiri Hospital, Kochi. He, his passion is pulmonary critical care. And he is just so updated with all his knowledge that everything that may be new, every time the condition is little <clears throat> uh, something challenging, then he always knows how to really sort it out. He's got the most, best oral presentation papers so many times in critical care uh, papers and critical care uh, conferences. And he's been faculty in many, many national conferences and so many paper presentations, so many prizes, and of course, great knowledge in pulmonary critical care. So warm welcome to you, Dr. Niranjan. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so with this star faculty, we start our, uh, our panel discussion. So uh, let's start with the uh, basics and let's start with the maestro. So coming to you, Dr. Kilnani, can mm. you please tell us, of course, Dr. Chavla told us so well, but just to brush up, you know, because we got so much information today. So just to brush up, can you tell us which are the different modes of ventilation? And we want to basically know what is the difference between pressure control, volume control and PRVC mode. So, uh, Dr. Amida, thank you very much for uh, getting me here. And uh, But actually, Dr. 
who is better than rajesh to tell us all this and he has already said what is volume control and what is pressure control what i would like to clarify that it really doesn't matter whether, whether your choice is volume control or the pressure control important thing is neither the volume nor the pressure should rise above permissible limit what i want to say that there is a barrow trauma and there is a volume trauma the barrow trauma is because of the pressure so that your pressure has to be uh, should not exceed plateau pressure more than 30 because it will lead to hypotension and lead to decrease venous return and so many other adverse effects and also the volume trauma which is actually relatively a newer concept not so new uh, the ards net trial set it right that you know the previously we used when i was doing intensive care in the beginning we were using 10 to 12 ml per kg because the volume trauma leads to over distension of alveoli leading to liberation of cytokines and uh, which itself can cause uh, acute lung injury and ards so therefore the pressure and volume so when you use a pressure controlled uh, ventilation uh, then uh, the volume can vary and that is why you have uh, checks what is called uh, uh, the alarms and those are always set some people feel that for ards they prefer uh, pressure controlled ventilation uh, pressure regulated control ventilation but my personal choice i always some are prefer to use volume control ventilation now to circumvent this volume and control confusion there is a relatively newer mode what is called as pressure regulated volume control now that the name is very confusing and so is the mechanism what it does is that you set a tidal volume say for 400 or 450 now the pressure is regulated to give so that you give minimum amount of pressure to achieve this particular tidal volume how do you do that it is a adaptive mode of ventilation that is that based on the previous cycle the ventilator decides on the flow it is a chip based uh, the mechanism is difficult to understand that it is a adaptive mode of ventilation where the based on the previous cycle the ventilator decides the flow so as to give minimum pressure to achieve the tidal volume that is what is called pressure regulated volume control ventilation majority of ventilators have this uh, mode of ventilation which is there are not too many studies which have proven it uh, although the concept seems to be right so so my choice is that i use volume control ventilation that is assist control mode of mechanical ventilation and if i am not able to maintain uh, uh, a good tidal volume with good pressure then i i can go on to pressure regulated volume control one of the study which was done it showed that actually the tidal volume is more than what what you set in but uh, this is not a great study i would say the other modes which are used uh, uh, which are actually uh, they are not modes inverse ratio ventilation and so on and so forth which has been uh, given up right. so the tr- trick of uh, trick of ventilation is that driving pressure has already been discussed or plateau pressure the lower the plateau pressure better is the survival so that that that's the bottom line wonderful so i think this was really an excellent tip that was given to us so basically just summarize what sir said pressure control ventilation you decide the pressure you decide the respiratory rate and patient gets volume as per the lung condition in volume control you're fixing up the volume that you want to deliver you decide you're deciding the respiratory rate and based on this the pressure may go up or low based on the lung condition but you have to set the alarm if you, you, have you to put set the, the alarm, volume control, right Yeah, yeah, you have to send the pre question yes. yes i asked about prvc sir to you because dr priyanka from karnataka had asked the question specifically about the prvc mode and so nicely you told us that it's the best of both in which you give your volume and you don't allow the pressure rise that much but the studies have not specifically said that it's better so thank you sir this was great uh, after this i'd like to come to dr manoj so dr manoj uh, let's go to the basics you know again very well already spoken but to just revise so if i want to put a patient on a ventilator who's completely normal like for example maybe he underwent some uh, injury you know he had some fracture any underwent a surgery 
a post op you want to ventilate him so in a normal patient what would be the settings of a mechanical ventilator and if the patient has obstructive airway disease and if he gets intubated then what would be your settings can you tell us please so so yes ma'am so you have asked two questions so the answer to one we assume that the patient has a normal lung and he needs a ventilator for non pulmonary reasons a surgery so as dr khilani sir very rightly said first of all your unit should be comfortable in only one mode of ventilation exceptional patient one may be lying in the corner who probably is an ards needs ecmo they are the only ones who need a different mode so if the patient is shifted post op by the anesthetist colleague you continue your most used ventilator mode if you use like khilani sir said volume control switch on the volume control prvc switch on the volume prvc because it is actually the nurse who is going to monitor you are only just going to decide safe limits of ventilation so switch on the prvc set the tidal volume and as very rightly said with the previous speaker 6 to 8 ml per kg if diseased lung can ventilate well normal lungs will always be in a luxury of more ventilation in fact now in critical care we are going towards in anesthesiology ultra low tidal volume 2 to 3 ml per kg in the ot so whatever you give 6 to 8 is enough 6 is actually more luxury to the patient but the problem in post op patient is the the outcome is surgeon dependent if the surgeon wants to extubate in 2 hours to 12 hours you sometimes as a doctor become a slave then what happened is as a pulmonologist you lose your outcome because you do not know the analgesia here needs you do not know the fluid needs you do not know how nasty was the surgery in the ot so but to cut the heterogeneity short overnight ventilation what are the settings you told us about yes. the so i'm i'm going to come to that yes so most of the times if the patient has come to you on ventilator forget that day extubation that is the first principle so don't wean that day so use judicious sedation use optimal fluid use normal peep that is 5 use a normal rr that is 12 to 15 and if i have to lowest see hyperoxia also also can be dangerous to the post op patient because hyperoxia can cause a lot of atelectasis in the normal lung use f5 to 21 to 30 and please sedate maintain the volume balance and, and then go to the next day this is answer to the first question second question coad a patient of coad actually needs ventilation when he has failed a medical therapy so putting him on the vent do not reduce the medical therapy i mean to say continue the optimal med- medical therapy in fact now nowadays intensive care colleagues are very happy giving a myofascial infusion which in our md days we used to give in the ward so continue myofascial infusion and ventilation should be here a little different because he has a propensity to develop auto peep so sedate if required give a muscle relaxant for at least 12 to 24 hours so that auto peep doesn't develop tidal volume here you can go up because they have a little bit of air hunger their needs are different they will be having good volume retention because of the high dead space inherently because of the copd you can go up till 8 ml per kg that is number 1 rr 12 to 14 is okay uh, all of you must be having actually etc to monitoring devices although abg the the pco to etc to don't fare well at absolute numbers but the trend is better monitor etc to and use the lowest fio2 to, to ventilate for oad and see the effect of the diaphragm you know sometimes they are not good uh, breathers so sometimes still beginning with invasive pressure support ventilation or simv is also not bad idea for copd if they are having auto peep even on most control setting on prvc so that is within one hour you should know whether they are failing this just don't knock them off sometimes even pure control modes for copd is not taken by their own diseased lung very positively so within an hour is a good idea to check in abg and see the effectiveness of your initial setting it is like bypass only check again in one hour that was wonderful very very correct so if it's a patient who is normal you can also give 6 ml per kg of uh, uh, tidal volume you can go up to 6 to 8 12 to 15 is the rr if i had to as low as possible peep of 5 point very well taken but i really like what you said was obstructive airway disease please continue correct medical therapy because you know putting yeah. on ventilation does not say that now you can pull back on medicines so medical yeah. therapy continue you want to give tidal volume could be 8 ml you want to keep rr less so that you want to give longer time for expiration you want to keep on looking at the peak pressures because you don't want him to get barotrauma and you uh, basically want to make sure that oxygen is as much 
to keep a saturation of 90 to 94. You need not hyper uh, oxygenate the patient. Excellent. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Coming to Dr. Anshum, Dr. Manoj told us about auto peep. Two, three times he kept on saying about auto peep. So I want to ask you, what is auto peep on a patient who's on a ventilator? How do we diagnose it and how do we fix it? Right. So thank you, ma'am, for the question. So <clears throat> auto peep, uh, as we understand, is also called as internal peep. So it is the internal positive end expiratory pressure that we commonly see in patients who have uh, respiratory failure or chronic respiratory diseases on ventilator. Dr. Vishweshwan had given a very nice graphic showing how auto peep can develop. So basically what it means is that before the exhalation finishes, the patient takes another breath. So there's another inspiration. So with time, you, you know, you would see that because the exhalation wasn't complete. So there's a kind of a dynamic hyperinflation that is happening. So in addition to whatever peep we are giving, the total peep would also contain an element of an auto peep. Now, uh, because it involves the exhalation and the inspiration, the best way to diagnose it is just by looking at the volume time curve. So you look at the flow, you look at the ventilatory um, flows, and you can notice that Exhalation never reaches the baseline and before it reaches the baseline, there's another inspiration. So one of the best ways is to just look at the monitor and we will be able to uh, see that a patient has auto peep. The other way is that most ventilators have an expiratory hold button. So if we press this button for just two seconds at the end of expiration, it gives us a peep value, which is the auto peep. So uh, this auto peep and the uh, external peep together is the total peep that the patient is receiving. So that's another way in which we can diagnose what uh, what is the level of auto peep in this patient? How to treat it? Um, see, uh, like he mentioned uh, in COPD patients. So here again, the role of bronco, uh, you know, bronchodilation, making sure there are not much secretions. Other factors, you know, like the tube size, whether we are using a very small tube, which is causing external resistance and um, so these things need to be corrected if the tube kinked. Other than that, what we can do is now we want a, a you know a better expiratory time. So we make the IE ratio more one is to two, one is to three, even up to that. So we want a better expiratory time, a lesser inspiratory time. We don't want more rapid breaths because they'll accumulate more breaths at the end of exhalation. So we can reduce the respiratory uh, rate and we can also reduce the volume that we are giving because they're already hyperinflated. So that's the way of managing auto peep. Yeah, wonderful. So, you know, as Dr. Anshum rightly said, patients mainly of asthma and COPD have a high chance of getting auto peep. And therefore, please look at your graphs. And if your expiratory loop is not touching the baseline, then this patient is auto peep. And otherwise, you just press the expiratory pause button. You'll get the to total peep and you subtract the peep that you're giving, which will tell you about the auto peep. And to correct it, please correct the primary pathology. Give bronchodilatation, as she rightly said. You reduce the respiratory rate. You can reduce the tidal volume and you can increase the inspiratory time. And sometimes also inspiratory flow increase will also help this condition. So thank you, Dr. Anshum, for this complete answer. Now coming to uh, Dr. Nilanjan. So, you know, uh, Dr. Chavla and Dr. Vishwes and Dr. Khilnani, the masters, kept on talking about the alarms in the ventilator. So can you tell me like which of the parameters require an alarm and what are the ranges of alarms that we keep? If you can just tell us about it. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for this very relevant question. Uh, I think we have to uh, respect the alarms of the ventilator. So uh, different ventilators uh, are having a different set of alarms that we can set. Now, most of these alarms can be set by us manually. And uh, commonly, the alarms uh, that we look into and set is the uh, one is the tidal volume, uh, the minute ventilation, uh, the respiratory rate. And uh, then certain alarms that we need to observe, that is uh, the peak pressures, uh, which we also can set to some extent. So uh, the normal, if you ask me the normal ranges, it uh, depends uh, a bit on the uh, condition of the patient, uh, what uh, pathology the patient is having, the underlying disease. Now coming to uh, the first alarm, like uh, suppose one of the most common alarms that we get on the ventilator uh, is that of tidal volume not getting delivered. And it also corresponds uh, to a low minute ventilation. So th uh, this can be uh, primarily we need to check uh, right from the endotracheal tube, the entire circuit to the patient. Uh, it can be due to kinking of the tube. Uh, it can be due to the patient biting the tube. And uh, then coming to the patient factors, it can be due to some uh, mucus plugs, some increased secretions or uh, due to severe bronchospasm. 
so uh, the other common alarm that uh, we get on the ventilator is that of a uh, peak airway pressure increased airway pressures okay this again uh, we need to check from the uh, endotracheal tube to, to the patient uh, again it can be due to any blockage of the tube with secretions or uh, due to severe bronchospasm now another alarm Uh, that we commonly encounter, uh, especially in ARDS patients, in patients who are uh, having resolving ARDS, is because of increased respiratory rate. Uh, we already set a high respiratory rate in these patients, but in spite of that, uh, their respiratory rate might be even you know thirty five, forty, uh, if they are not uh, paralyzed and uh, this one. So uh, that is mainly uh, because of their air hunger, and uh, so we either need to adjust or increase the uh, respiratory flow rate so they. achieve the required amount of uh, oxygen or the air that they require the required flow or uh, we can sedate these patients uh, and uh, sedate and paralyze them to reduce their air hunger okay. now uh, if these are all on uh, controlled modes of ventilation now if we uh, go to our uh, pressure support or the uh, spontaneous modes of ventilation uh, the most common alarm that uh, we encounter and uh, we should be aware of is the um, apnea ventilation so uh, nowadays uh, most of the ventilators they have a backup mode of ventilation so even when we uh, go for a uh, cpap or a pressure support ventilation and we have a backup so uh, the ventilator itself switches to a control mode uh, in case the patient goes into apnea and this apnea time can be set by us like for 30 seconds if the patient is not uh, triggering a breath for 30 seconds it goes into a uh, backup ventilation a control mode of ventilation so this apnea alarm is again uh, very important and uh, when we are switching to pressure support uh, make sure that uh, you keep this backup mode of ventilation so that even if the patient uh, goes into an apnea for say 30 seconds or a 45 seconds uh, it goes back into the backup mode of ventilation right so no, no, all no, this no. yeah Yeah. Oh, wonderful. I mean, you've told us everything that we needed to know. I really like this point that you made about you know a spontaneous modes where you have to have an apnea alarm. And uh, as uh, you rightly said, alarms will be based on the condition that we are ventilating the patient for. And as Dr. Chawla said, that the alarm should be ten to twenty percent range of what you are aiming. So great, very very good. After this, I'd like to come to Dr. Chawla. Thank you, Dr. Nanjan. Now I'd like to come to Dr. Chawla. so let's talk about the humidification because it's actually very very important and often people don't talk about it so can you please tell us about why do we need humidification in a mechanically ventilated patients and what are the types of humidifiers and uh, how often should we change what is hme can you tell us please you know if you give a dry gas to a patient the airways will get dry secretions will get dried up even the epithelium can be denuded and you know when the secretions get dried up and then patients are very prone to atelectasis and then patient is more prone to infection because of this and you know these secretions when they get thickened they don't come out so it is sort of mandatory to humidify the air like normally we humidify ourselves when the when we breathe so it needs to be humidified now for many years we have been using water heated uh, humidifiers but lately about last about 15 to 20 years now hme has uh, come in heated humidifier were uh, the best but you know difficulty in logistic and maintaining temperature the hme came in so now the even the water heated uh, mm. humidifiers they are also good they you you need to give between 30 mg water to pressure to the the humidity should be 44 mg water that that is the humidity the in the water is recommended and the temperature should be between 34 to 41 ideally it would be 37 but difficult to maintain when the the air is moving it gets top so there are wires to heat it when the when the air is passing so normally 34 to 41 degree is the temperature of this and the relative humidity should be 100% and they are you know usually nowadays more often used when hme cannot be used now hme is a hydrophobic membrane which absorbs the patient humidity when the, the patient is expiring and that is used for humidification and uh, you know but there are uh, conditions it adds about 50 ml of dead space you must remember that's why 
in ARDS when you are doing a low tidal volume ventilation, many a times there is a hypercarbia which is unmanageable. You remove the HMEs. When patients have a thick secretions, patients have a blood, or patient is ventilating more than ten liters per minute, then also it really would not be useful. So these are the condition and hypothermic patient. These are the condition where you would not like to use HME. And most often it is the clogging by secretions and blood. And then you don't like to use this and then you go on to that. Now, as far as the changing of HME is concerned, you see we have been changing every 24 hours also. Initially when it started, we were changing six to seven days. Then it came down to changing every day. But normally about 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours, these need to be changed. And you should follow manufacturers also, they write down then when it needs to be changed. Normally, we have a practice about 48 hours. Okay, and wonderful. And 24 hours would be even better. Okay, wonderful. This was great. A complete answer. Thank you so much. Coming to Dr. Khilnani. So, sir, we put a patient on a ventilator. We put him on normal settings. And now the patient is hypoxic. So, what are different modes, by what are different ways in which we can improve oxygenation in a patient? So, I guess, Dr. Amita, you are talking about a patient with ARDS. But if you want to talk about ARDS and tell an intensivist, intensivist to talk about it, he'll spend the whole night talking about it. So, suggest the modes, like you do one, two, three, four, right, like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so the the best way to maintain oxygenation is, of course, the besides the ventilation strategies we have talked about, is the use of PEEP. The PEEP, there are, there are two ways of using, whether you want to high high PEEP or low PEEP. Uh, there are no no uh, conclusions into this. I, I usually use a low PEEP and then increase the PEEP. That is my personal choice. Some people use decremental PEEP. And PEEP has been talked about in great detail by the uh, uh, Dr. Vishwasharan. And so... I'll talk about the recruitment manual, you know, that is uh, something which is, uh, which was a fancy thing 20 years back. That is, that means you give, make, make the lung open and keep it open. So what you do is that in a, paralyze the patient, give a peep of 30 or 40 centimeters of water for a period of 30 seconds in a hope that the alveoli, alveoli will be inflated. And then bring it back to the low tidal volume ventilation in the hope that they will not deflate. But somehow this strategy has not found to be useful in clinical practice because of the uh, it, it requires a paralysis and outcome has not changed. So the other ways of recruiting in the infant you use uh, you know oscillatory ventilation which we don't use that is also considered a recruitment. Prone position is also considered a recruitment. What what you are doing in the prone position that the alveoli which are collapsed in the supine position you make them prone, and that is one strategy of recruitment. There is a large randomized trial which has shown survival benefit, and that is actually standard of practice. So I'll stop there. There are so many issues to be talked about. Yes, sir, perfectly said. Thank you so much. You know, sir, we improve, we either increase the oxygen or we basically can uh, increase the peep. Peep recruitment maneuvers now given up uh, and uh, otherwise we make the patient prone and also we can reduce the I to E ratio to give a longer inspiratory time. But now again in ERDS, it's not really recommended. So thank you, sir. Uh, coming to Dr. Manoj, uh, basically, you know, Dr. Anshum told us about secretions which can result in auto peep. And Dr. Chavla also told us about, you know, not using humidification will increase secretions. So I want to tell you that how do we diagnose bronchial secretions in a patient who's on a ventilator? You are mute. mute yeah. uh -huh. So if you have a graphics here, so on the flow time graph or a pressure time graph, you will have what is called a seesaw pattern or a very zigzag pattern coming in the expiratory limb. And it touches the baseline. And that is when you actually diagnose. And actually, this is the most unseen graphic by the intensive care people because they are more worried, worried about alarms. Here, no one will have an alarm, but you will slowly see that the graphs continue to show more seesaw pattern. And if that is there, definitely see your limb. And as rightly said by Dr. Chavla, in current times, we are actually overlooking the humidification as well. 
So it, the presence of secretion is a good sign. That means it is humidification is good, but it's a bad sign because sometimes we over rely on the closed suction devices. If that is also still there, you should actually do the manual open suction in a sterile way. Okay, great. So this was, I think, a very important point because honestly, how many of us really look at the saw toothing of expiratory limb, and we must because our patients are asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis, pneumonia, ARDS. So we must must start looking at the uh, expiratory limb if saw toothing is present or not. So thank you so much. Uh, coming to Dr. Anshum now. So the thing is that uh, everybody has been talking about type two respiratory failure. So I want to ask you that if a patient has high PCO two on a ventilator, then in what way can we get the carbon dioxide down? Okay, and at the same time, how can we monitor PCO2 continuously or intermittently without doing ABGs because ABGs are expensive? Uh, so, um, one thing, uh, CO2 uh, build up or uh, you know, hypercapnia usually develops either because the ventilation is poor or there's more dead space ventilation or, or either the production of CO2 is high. So, if you look at those physiologies, uh, based on the underlying physiology, we'll be able to manage hypercapnia in a patient. Now, if it's dead space ventilation, then there are a lot of factors that are happening at our end also when we are treating the patient, like, you know, putting the HME filters, like Sir said, or having too many catheter mounts and not connecting the ET tube directly, which can increase the dead space and worsen the hypercapnia. So those those factors definitely in such a patient need to take care and, uh, you know, so, so that is one. Secondly, we want to increase the minute ventilation. So we may want to increase the tidal volume in this case. Uh, although we talk about low tidal volume lung protective strategy, but here, you know, uh, we would want to have a better tidal volume, a better minute ventilation in our patients and obviously also correct the cause. So if it's a narcotic, uh, you know, so if a patient ha had a narcotic abuse, we may want to give it an antidote. If it's bronchospasm because of COPD, then make sure that there's adequate bronchodilation. So those things still remain and we want to improve the mechanic, the ventilation, the tidal volume and reduce the death rate. Wonderful. I mean, very, very nicely said, Anshum. Perfect. Great. So now coming to Dr. Nilanjan, uh, I'd like to basically ask you that we all know that this is really a hot topic and Dr. Kinlani said that we may talk about it all night. And Dr. Vishwes covered it. But if a patient has ERDS, just very quickly, if you can tell us what should be your ideal settings and what should you look at? Yeah. Uh, as uh, Kilani sir said, it's a huge uh, topic in itself. Uh, I'll just give some quick points. Uh, first, start with the tidal volume of uh, 6 ml per kg of the uh, predicted body weight. So now predicted body weight is an important point here. And uh, do not see the actual body weight of the patient. Then uh, set a high peep, uh, or rather than a high peep, I would say an optimal peep. And again, there are uh, numerous methods of uh, setting an optimal peep. Uh, we can use the ARDS, uh, the network uh, protocol table. We can uh, use the incremental or the decremental method. And uh, then we can use the best compliance method. And uh, uh, we need to make sure that the plateau pressure is uh, less than 30, or uh, as recently said, the driving pressure, uh, which has been a recent... Uh, uh, addition, uh, preferably to keep the driving pressure less than 14. Then uh, we need to uh, increase the respiratory rate. Uh, we tend to keep it at a higher level, like uh, 25 uh, to 30, or even uh, we can go up to 35. And uh, we uh, target a, a saturation SpO2 of around 88 to 92. That's uh, enough according to our guidelines. When a PO2 of uh, 55 uh, to 65, 70 is enough. And also the important point of hyper, uh, permissive hypercapnia as has been raised by many of our speakers uh, that we can even uh, uh, keep the pH as low as 7.2. This was yeah. excellent. I mean, a perfect yeah. answer. Thank That's, you so much. Uh, yeah. Uh, moving now to Dr. Chabla, uh, a lot of people have been talking about, you know, ventilator patient asynchrony. So how do we, what are the different types and from the ventilator graph, how can we make out that there's an asynchrony between patient and ventilator? You know, first I'll talk about what is synchrony. Synchrony is when patient initiates a breath. That means patient triggered breath properly gets a breath. That is synchrony. But if it does not occur, that is asynchrony. And the it can occur at the triggering level and at the cycling level, also the during the delivery of the breath. So suppose patient makes an effort 
and he doesn't get anything from the ventilator neither a volume control or a nor a pressure control breath that means that is ineffective trigger so you will see a negative deflection but not followed by in the graphics not followed by any breath that is ineffective trigger most of the time this is because of auto peep patient mm -hmm. is making an effort but not able to overcome and initiate the breath from the ventilator not able to open the inspiratory valve that is ineffective trigger so you have to give a antispasm bronch take care of bronchospasm and sometime you give up at least 80% of auto peep so patient is able to trigger and most of the ineffective triggers would go then there is a double trigger that means patient started a breath got a breath from the ventilator but patient is still making an effort his inspiratory drive is still on but the ventilator has stopped so it triggers again and that is a double trigger and the tidal volume in a double trigger would be much more and the, then is auto trigger you kept a sensitivity suppose less than minus 1 so machine will keep on opening the inspiratory valve that is called the auto trigger and it is also stimulated sometimes secretion in the circuit or by the cardiac and by the movements so you need to look at this the auto trigger these are the three common ones and otherwise without graphics it will be difficult to explain and uh, so these are the three common uh, asynchrony then there is a cycling also but i think i'll just stop here this was fantastic this is what i wanted to know uh, this is great so i think looking at the graphics is very very important to make sure our patient is ventilated correctly coming to dr khilnani in fact dr nirenjan sare talking about it i stopped him because i wanted you to oh. answer the question So, what is permissive hypercapnia, and how much pH and PCO two would be acceptable? And if required, do we should we give IV HCO three if there's too much of acidosis? Uh, suggest the. Oh, uh, so, doctor, I mean the uh, permissive hypercapnia is not a new concept at all. All everything boils down to the safe mechanical ventilation. When in severe case of ARDS, in asthma, or COPD, when Despite giving six to eight mL per kilogram of body weight of uh, tidal volume and uh, respiratory rate of fifteen to twenty-five or thirty, you are you see that uh, to keep the plateau pressure and peak pressure low that is less than thirty, the CO two starts rising because the carbon dioxide in the blood is a marker of ventilation. so if the patient patient is requiring high tidal volume or high peak pressure or high plateau pressure to maintain the co2 it is better to reduce the keep the tidal volume low let the co2 rise and that is called permissive hypercapnia the result will be the co2 would rise and as a uh, as a compensation the ph would drop so we have seen in the copd patient even the PCO2 of 100, 110 patients are conscious. Even 80, 60 we tolerate all the time. At 50 people are moving around, going to offices. So high CO2 usually does not cause much of uh, trouble. It is the pH. Uh, in the acute, first, first and foremost, the permissive high in hypercapnia, the CO2 rise should be allowed slowly. It should not be rapid rise. Number one. number 2 the ph should be monitored number 3 that there are certain condition where it is contraindicated and these are the central nervous system condition tumors meningitis because there the high co2 would lead to bronchodilatation uh, uh, bronchodilatation and raise the icp pressure that must be kept in mind if the ph is up to 7.2 and co2 is 70 you don't no need to worry if it is drop it is lower than 7.2 then one has to because there are cardiovascular effects of this there are effects of ca on cardiac rhythm there a, so one should consider giving soda bicarb so as to maintain ph above 7.2 that's about it wonderful sir thank you so much coming now to dr manoj so the thing is that uh, dr nilanjan very nice to see you Uh, he very nicely told us about the settings in a patient of ARDS. So I want to basically say that how do you decide what PEEP to keep in a patient of ARDS, and as you're increasing the PEEP, what precautions you want to take? Okay, so as Dr. Khilani said, a very important point. Remember, all of you, recruitment is actually the basic C on initial phase. Recruitment is 
touching the inspiratory part of the lungs mechanics and pleep is expiratory touching of the mechanics so hit hard and hit once it is not like you keep playing with the ventilator in every shift or every new doctor every consultant start with high so what is high peep in indian setting most of the patients we should never go above 15 of peep if we generally try with recruitment if the patient has a recruitable lung we play with peep so we start with 15 of ventilation with 6 mils per uh, kg tidal volume if the patient is non recruitable we immediately prone them so then there is no playing with peep prone means peep of 5 to 6 for age but if we are giving peep we only give highest peep which is in a recruitable lung and then we come down when we are on 15 peep that means you are having a very high intrathoracic pressure and you are touching the release model of actually improving the dead space ventilation and reducing the shunt and you assume that there are less normal vq mismatch lung so you are actually touching the physiology and that is when hemodynamics and sometimes barotrauma may affect the lung negatively so take care of the hemodynamics take care of airway pressures and ensure smooth muscle relaxation in the journey for minimum 12 hours when you set the highest peep and then come down slowly come down every 12 hours by 1 minus or 2 minus of the peep that is how we manage ards yeah that's wonderful okay great so uh, now i'd like to come to anshum so anshum we have a question from dr jay bhanushali from mumbai and he's asking what should be the ventilatory settings in a patient who's got ild or ipf and how will you decide the tidal volume for this patient uh before i uh, answer that question actually last time you asked i missed answering the point on uh, co2 monitoring so just just wanted to mention that because in case mo- someone wanted to listen to it so we don't see if we have an end tidal co2 monitoring or a capnography going on simultaneously sometimes uh, which which can be in the mainstream with the et or it could also be side stream there are also volumetric capnometers now uh, which are available volumetric capnography which also measures it against the tidal volume so it gives more data and there are transcutaneous co2 monitors also we use it in pediatric sleep studies also so those can also be used for monitoring but i should before you come to this previous answer i mean thank you so much because i also missed out you know because even i asked you two parts and your first part was so complete that i got overwhelmed so thank you so much you know for talking about this uh, uh, carbon dioxide monitoring without abg so we do etco2 we do capnography and uh, this is definitely useful we should do it okay now coming to this question about ild ipf which dr jay is asking us Secondly, regarding IPF patients, uh, we all know that we should avoid invasive mechanical ventilation as much as possible in our IPF patients because there is a very very high risk of mortality. In fact, there are some studies that have noted fifty to hundred percent mortality uh, right at the time of uh, you know instituting the mechanical ventilation till one year later after that in IPF patients. So one is we avoid as as much as possible. Secondly, if we have to, then we remember that because the lung compliance is poor in these patients, we want to give a lower tidal volume, maybe much lower than than the six six mL per kg uh, idle body weight unit. So we can start with five, and also we want to have a lower minute ventilation, a lower respiratory rate, and we want to achieve lower P plats in these patients. So there is more risk of barotrauma. There is more risk of um uh, ventilator induced lung injury because not all of the lung is recruitable the fibrotic part will not recruit so we have to make sure that we are giving a lesser peep lesser volume and lesser respiratory rate we can allow some permissive hypercapnia in that case and uh, so that we avoid barotrauma in these patients Uh, correct you know but uh, just to add on i agree with dr anshum said but sometimes you know patients of ild we just can't ventilate and if we just can't ventilate often we get minute ventilation of 1.5 and 2 in which case we are happier to go up on rr because when we go up on rr we are making sure ventilation happens and we also preventing increased peak airway pressures so as dr anshum rightly said avoid ventilation is possible you want to ventilate them only if you are looking at a reason which is kind of correctable like a pneumonia or something and you basically want to give them less tidal volume and you want to give them a peep maybe which is 5 or you basically just adjust uh, rr you could go up and you keep on looking at your plateau and peak pressures because a very high chance of barotrauma and uh, we would prefer to use 6 ml per kg as dr anshum said thank you so much that was great dr anshum now coming to dr nilanj and dr anshum anshum spoke about peak ev pressures which are going high so when with the peak pressure ev pressures go up i mean what does it indicate peak ev pressures alarms going up what is the meaning of this 
Uh, just quickly, because everybody, we have about twenty-five more questions remaining. So, so maybe peak, yeah. trying to take uh, all the questions. So uh, peak airway pressure is isolated peak airway pressure without an increase in plateau pressure. It primarily indicates an airway issue. So again, we have to start right from the uh, patient and uh, the endotracheal tube, the circuit, and the patient. The endotracheal tube it can be due to kinks or blockages or secretions or mucus flux. And uh, the patient, it can be again uh, due to increased secretions in his airways, or it can be due to increased or severe bronchospasm. Now, if the patient is having uh, both an increase in the plateau pressure as well as an increase in the peak pressure, then it is primarily an issue of compliance and not just an airway issue. So that uh, can occur in uh, ARDS or, or as uh, Dr. Ansham said in I ILDs, IPF, etc. So uh, it's always uh, along with the peak pressure, we can uh, just do an um, inspiratory hold uh, maneuver and check the plateau pressure also. And uh, then we can uh, troubleshoot accordingly. Wonderful. I mean, that was just a perfect, complete answer. Uh, by the way, I'd love to announce because the techn technical team has told us. Yeah, sir, just a minute. Sorry. The technical team has told us that we have 1,662 logins even now. And they've requested to continue at least for 10 to 15 more minutes. So I think three cheers for all of you all. You are really rock. Coming to Khilani, sir. Khilani, sir, tell us, please. No, I just wanted to say the peak pressure is determined by impedance of the respiratory system, which is determined by chest wall, pleura, and compliance of the lung and airway. So whenever the peak pressure is high, you have to start from the chest wall and then look at the pneumothorax, pleural effusion, so on and so forth. Just wanted to add that part also. And of course, the mu mucus plug causing collapse of the lung or whatever. So, no, wonderful, just sir. Wanted to add that. Yeah, no, no, wonderful. Coming to Dr. Chavla, we have actually Dr. Ridha, we have Dr. Manisha and Dr. Sanket asking that if the patient has persistent airway leak, then what would be the ventilatory settings and what are the implications? You know, this is one of the most uh, difficult condition to ventilate because if you ventilate normally, there is a lot of air leak. And you know, the air leak is directly proportioned to the mean airway pressure, which is dependent on the tidal volume, the amount of PEEP you give and the inspiratory time if you are giving the pressure control. So when you ventilate these patients, either you can use the normal modes or you can use alternate modes. The normal modes, which is suggested is that you give a, if you are using a volume control mode, give a low tidal volume. And the first thing what we do when we are on rounds and there is a leak, take the PEEP to minimum, maybe zero or one. That's number one you should do. Then bring down the tidal volume. You can increase the respiratory rate to have a reasonable tidal uh, minute ventilation. So this strategy would work. The second, you can go to the pressure preset modes. If you are possible, give a pressure support mode. At least the good amount of ventilation in spite of leak that will increase in the flow to maintain some amount of tidal volume. And the third thing is try to get them off the ventilator faster. Because if they are out of the ventilator faster, then the leak problem is not there. But then if you are not able to do with this strategy, then there are alternate modes which can be used. People have tried. They are more theoretical, but usually in practice we very rarely use one was suggested was airway pressure release. People have tried with success. High frequency, people don't have machine now, but I have used high frequency ventilation in earlier part uh, to manage the bronchopleural leak. And some people have done the independent lung ventilation like you heard the speaker talking, but these are easier said than done in a practice. And of course, when there are large leak, young patients, salvage patients, ECMO should be also done because then you can really go to the 2 or 3 ml or extubate the patient and just continue on ECMO and allow the leak to heal. So these are the various things can be done, but very, very difficult. And then talking when there is a real patient and a large leak, very, very difficult to manage these patients. So one has to know these basic principles. And the most important thing is the first thing you see a little leak, please take the peep down to 0 or 2. You know, and zero is also okay. Sometimes the leak will decrease in these patients. And mean airway pressure, the leak is proportional to the mean airway pressure. So inspiratory time, you decrease the inspiratory time if you're giving a pressure control. 
So that will also decrease the mean airway pressure and the leak would be less. So all these things can be done to ventilate these patients and allow hypercapnia in these patients because uh, you have to do a safe ventilation and with the hope that this leak will close. I think this was fantastic. I mean, a complete state-of-the-art answer. And we just realized so many people wanted to actually uh, know this answer. In fact, Dr. Vishwes had covered this point. Uh, he was wanting to cover this point, but his talk was getting longer. So we told him to cut it short. And Dr. Chawla, thank you so much for giving us a complete answer. I wanted to really stress upon the taking out the P part, allowing hypercapnia, uh, permissive hypercapnia. And if required, you could do a blocker and independent lung ventilation and ECMO is an option for large leaks. So that was great. Uh, coming to Dr. Khilani. So the thing is that uh, Dr. Chawla told us about persistent air leak patient. If a patient has undergone a thoracotomy, you know, if he's undergone a surgery about the lungs, could it be like uh, a lobectomy or pneumonectomy or a BPF closure? Then when you want to ventilate this patient post-op, maybe just for a day, then what are the special precautions you would take? The precautions are same for the safe ventilation. If you have a uh, patient has undergone a pneumonectomy, then volume required is much less. That needs to be the same about peak pressure and plateau pressure has to be monitored. Usually the ventilation is not difficult because the rest of the lung which is not touched is healthy. So there is no difficulty in uh, maintaining the oxygenation and the uh, uh, carbon dioxide, the dictum is that they should be activated as early as possible so that they they get rid of positive pressure ventilation because the uh, the the pressure would harm the lung you know, the the mechanical ventilation what we give is an unphysiological way of ventilating the patient so so answering your question, it's not difficult to ventilate the healthy even if one lung. But the same tidal volume should not be used. Tidal volume will have to be less. The pressure is plateau and peak pressure has to be kept as low as possible, extubate as quickly as possible. Use NIV later. Yeah, wonderful, sir. Very, very important. You want to get positive pressure off. And maybe, therefore, keeping PEEP zero also would be fine because they already have a good lung which is working. Um, okay, thank you, sir, for these enlightening points. Coming doctor, to Dr. Manu, something very, very important. I think this is a very important question, nebulization. We are talking all the time about obstructive airway diseases, COPD, asthma. So if a patient yeah. is on a ventilator and you want to nebulize a patient, then what type of nebulizer and what precautions quickly? Yes, quickly, uh, nebulization, actually, when the patient needs a ventilation, nebulization only if the patient needs for a prior disease. Just because you feel there is a bronchi or some rails, do not give nebulization. If it is mandatory to give an antibiotic in an inhaled format, there are nebulization which are uh, delivery devices available now. Erosion is available. For those who are already COPD, there is a device called DDI spiral, which is which becomes like a spacer and it is a completely collapsible, doesn't increase the dead space of the inspiratory circuit. You can actually apply and you can actually put the canister from the MDI and you can nebulize it. You don't need disconnections of the circuit. If a patient is of ARDS, there is no role of any nebulizer, even if the patient had any obstructive area. So 10 and plus PEEP, no nebulization. If you want nebulization, erosion nebulization, some ventilators have nebulization system inbuilt. That is also fine. And third is the DDI spiral, which is actually a Smith's product, uh, which is a collapsible. It becomes a part of the AV circuit. And that is how we can do it. Yeah, wonderful. What I really like the point is ARDS patient, please avoid nebulization because it cuts out the PEEP and it uh, cuts out the uh, uh, supply of uh, gases to the uh, air to the patient. So that is very, very important. And I feel that it would be good to always suction the patient before we start nebulizing so that we make sure that the nebulizer is going on well. Also, it would be good to remove the filter, I think, before nebulization. So thank you so much, Dr. Manoj. With this, now I'd like to come to Dr. Anshu, uh, I think the webinar is going on very, very well and we are getting continuously messages that continue. But I think I'll just to take last two questions. Let's end on a high note. Uh, last maybe three questions. So now coming to Dr. Anshu, if a patient develops a pneumothorax while he's on a ventilator, then what, ventil what will uh, suggest that the patient has uh, pneumothorax? I'm not asking what ventilation to give because Dr. Chawla has told us, but what is suggestive of a patient developing pneumothorax in a patient, not radiology, clinical features and ventilator things. 
So, uh, if a patient develops pneumothorax, one we've been talking about alarms. So, if it's a major severe pneumothorax, massive or, all, or tension pneumothorax, the alarms will go on. So, having said that, uh, we would see that the patient will struggle more with the ventilator. Um, hypoxia would worsen despite the same FiO2 setting which was there already. Um, hypotension uh, will occur despite being uh, adequately maintained earlier. So, we would see that the patient, uh, you know, worsens along with cardio, respiratory uh, disturbance and instability. Uh, in terms of the ventilator setting, the plateau pressures are going to be very high. So, if a patient is on volume control, we'll see higher plateau pressures. In a patient on pressure control, we'll see that the volumes, the tile volumes the, uh, that are achieved will be much lower. So, uh, that would give us an indicator. And then also on clinical examination, you know, the asymmetry of the chest movements and auscultation, we should be able to pick it up. Yeah. By the side uh, and in the ICU, there'll be like diagnostic. So, we can just diagnose it by using the ultrasound there. Yeah. So, I really liked what Dr. Anshun said. You know, it'd be alarm going high, high, high. So, the minute ventilation alarm will start ringing because the minute ventilation goes low, the peak airway pressures will start going up and the patient will be hypoxic, tachycardic, on fighting with the ventilator, tachycardia, hypotension, everything. So thank you so much. You know, so this tells you that there's probably a pneumothorax and we'll urgently do an ultrasound while we are waiting an x-ray. So great. Thank you so much, Dr. Anshun. This was perfect. Coming to Dr. Nilanjan. So uh, what we are bronchoscopists, we are interventional pulmonologists. So a patient on mechanical ventilation is requiring doing a bronchoscopy. So what are the settings that you'll adjust just for the bronchoscopy? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, bronchoscopy in the ICU uh, on a ventilated patient is uh, certainly challenging, especially if the patient is on a high oxygen requirement and uh, on a high PEEP, like for example, an ARDS patient. So, uh, rule number one would be uh, avoid a bronchoscopy unless it is uh, very essential uh, because uh, the first thing uh, that we are going to do is we are going to compromise on the oxygenation as well as uh, when we are introducing our bronchoscope, we are going to de-recruit the lung. We are going to, uh, there will, there's going to be a loss of PEEP. So uh, the oxygenation as well as the ventilation, uh, both of it, uh, both of it is going to suffer. So uh, and uh, prior the rather than uh, the settings, ventilatory settings during a bronchoscopy, uh, the settings prior to the uh, bronchoscopy is what I think is more important. So we need to optimize our uh, ventilatory settings, uh, pre-oxygenate the patient, uh, keep a hundred percent FiO two, uh, maybe around five to ten minutes before starting uh, the bronchoscopy. Uh, use nebulizations uh, so that there won't be any bronchospasm. And uh, if the patient is conscious and uh, it's uh, unrestless, uh, we might have to sedate and paralyze the patient uh, because we don't want the patient to uh, buck and there should not be any asynchrony during our bronchoscopy. And after uh, all this, uh, we can uh, do our bronchoscopy with uh, the uh, endotracheal adapter or the uh, mount cat so that some amount of ventilation and oxygenation occurs uh, even uh, during our bronchoscopy. And uh, yeah, the settings, I don't think there's uh, much of a difference in uh, the settings. Uh, we just need to monitor our parameters and uh, there's going to be a compromise in our uh, uh, ventilation. So the PCO2 might rise. So uh, we need to optimize all those uh, before we do our bronchoscopy and uh, do it as quickly as possible. Yeah, wonderful. Can I, can I, can I, can I add to this? Yes, sure, sir. So, so, so uh, since there is a loss of uh, volume, if you are using a volume <laughs> control ventilation, I generally increase the tidal volume by 100 milliliters. Uh, Yes, I was just going to say that. So, uh, sir is completely right. So, the patient in volume control, we automatically always before bronchoscopy, we increase the tidal volume by 100 ml than what we had kept. So, that the patient... And generally, and generally I don't paralyze them. And yes, and uh, if the patient is on pressure control, then we increase the pressure control alarm so that, you know, the noise doesn't keep on irritating us. Uh, I really like the point, Dr. Naranjan, what you spoke about increasing FIO to 100% 10 minutes before the procedure. Because normally people make it 100% just before starting the procedure. So pre oxygenating the patient would be very, very useful. If it's not ARDS, if it's some other condition, then it would be better to make PEEP zero. Because, you know, if the PEEP is more, then the retrieval of bile is less. So as compared to the fluid that we put in, much lesser amount of fluid comes out if the patient is on PEEP. So if you have the luxury and the patient is not too hypoxic, then it would be worth making the peak to zero and uh, maybe after the bronchoscopy nebulize the patient if required. So great. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, coming to Dr. Chawla, I think let's keep this as the last question. We have Dr. Bhaveja and Dr. Manisha. Two people have asked this question. 
that what is the relationship between the size of the endotracheal tube, the length of the endotracheal tube, and the size of tracheostomy tube in patients who have reduced lung reserve? So, <clears throat> first of all, I think you should, as an intensivist, you should not put in a tube less than 8 millimeter size because that's a bare minimum. And it has a lot of implication, particularly, you know, in patients of COPD and asthma. Because if you try to put a smaller tube, the airway resistance is going to be very high because you have to give high flow rates to these individuals. And even if you keep a peak pressure alarm of 80, 90, still it will get cut off on a volume control. And uh, uh, minimum, you should keep 8 millimeter. And similarly for the tracheostomy tube, you know, I'll tell you a very interesting study which I came across in status asthmaticus. Fortunately, with a good treatment of asthma, very few patients get ventilated with the status asthmaticus. It was a study published in 20, year 2022, a year ago, on a 33 or 34 patients of uh, bronchial asthma. And what they found, they compared 7 millimeter, 7.5 millimeter, and 8 millimeter. And the mortality was different. Mortality in 7 millimeter was 26%, 14% in 7.5, and 8 was less than 11%. So that much is the implication because ventilating a patient below 8 is very difficult. That implies. So in this study, they found even the mortality was related to the endotracheal tube size. So even if patient is shifted under you as a smaller tube, little stable, please change the tube to 8 millimeter. Otherwise, you will have a difficulty even in weaning these patients because if they have a thin tube, they will have a high resistance and you will really not be able to control that. So you should minimum whenever you are ventilating and most of the adults, you can put an 8 millimeter size. Even larger would be better if you can put 8.5 or 9, that would also be better in these patients. But tracheostomy tube, usually you always start with 8 millimeter because if you do use a very larger, then there is a chances of causing erosions and other things. But 8 millimeter tube, you should always use. Wonderful point. Very well taken. Uh, There's a quick question which uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dhiraj Jaiswal has asked that while nebulization, what should be the mode of ventilation? So you can continue the same mode of ventilation. There's no problem. Uh, and uh, we have Dr. Shrija, we have Dr. Priyanka, we have Dr. Shebaz, we have Dr. Vishal, we have Dr. Shreyami, we have Dr. Sangeeta and we have Dr. Sujata. And there are many names which I can't see, but they all have said amazing session, wonderful discussion, excellent talks. They have learned just so much. So I think with these wonderful comments and with more questions just coming in, we just got a new question right now. So I feel that with all this going on, let's just decide to call it a night. We've had a wonderful brain wrecking uh, a session of two hours and we still have 1662 people which are logged in which I think just talks about the quality of the star panelists that we have and the wonderful information that uh, they all have given to us and uh, with this uh, I would like to thank each of y'all on behalf of Indian Chess Society for being on board and for enlightening us for educating us and for giving so much of interesting practice changing tips and tricks a huge big thank you to each of y'all Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, ma'am, for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you, all fellow panelists. I would, learning from here. <laughs> I would also like to thank Sipla, of course, for being our education partners. They have done a fantastic job. I mean, we made the flyer and gave it to them yesterday at 6 p.m. And uh, they have definitely made sure that it goes to a lot of people. And thank you so much for this wonderful platform. Yeah, it was Ramita, absolutely... but I want to say something. Yes, sir. Or something. I don't think anybody can carry this weekly meeting other than you. So I don't know how to appreciate your effort of you know. It's it's, a, it's a, actually from heart. I दिल से बोलता हूँ बहुत मुश्किल काम है हर हफ्ते एक वेबिनार करना और सबको जो है ना और तुम्हारी बात है कि सब मान भी जाते हैं मेरी तो कोई आर्मी डिसकनेक्टेड नाउ और स्टिल ऑन यस स्टिल ऑन लाइन यस स्टिल ऑन लाइन सो ऑल ऑफ थैंक यू सो मच फॉर द टाइम वर्ड्स आई एम टच बट आई वुड गिव द क्रेडिट कंप्लीटली टू इंडियन चेयर सोसाइटी एंड टू आवर एंड टू आवर स्टाफ फैकल्टी ऑफ एवरी वेबिनार यू नो आई एम जस्ट एन इंस्ट्रूमेंट बट यू ऑल आर द वन हु आर द स्टार्स सो थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच अप्रिशिएट ओके अ बिग थैंक यू टीचर थैंक यू